Hi, welcome to the Roost Pack TV. I'm John Hoeful. With me today is Harley Schlanger, the Western States Coordinator for the Roost Pack. Uh, we're preparing a one hour video on uh, the collapse of the United States banking system, the need for Glass-Steagall, where things went wrong, what we have to do to make things right. And so we're having a series of discussions uh, along this line that will, some of this will be part of the video, others is just preparatory material. So that's what we're doing today. So welcome, Harley. Good to be here with you, John. All right. So the, uh, one of the things we want to focus on is the collapse of the savings and loan sector in the 1980s and the way in which this paved the way for the, uh, the real estate bubble. Mm -hmm. the, basically, it was a derivatives bubble based upon real estate right. that then has blown up spectacularly. So, you know, it's worth starting out by pointing out that had we not destroyed the SNLs, had they not been deliberately taken down, that what followed, all the destruction that followed, really would not have been possible. Well, and it's important to note that the original Glass-Steagall put a firewall up not just between the commercial banks and the investment banks, but also between commercial banks and the mortgage banks or the savings and loans, the thrift institutions, with the idea being that it would be protected so that you would not make spectacular rates of profit, but that you would have a consistent ability to make loans for home ownership and the payment of the money for the mortgages would go back into the savings and loans to create an income stream for a new pool for more mortgages to be made. And this was protected, and during this whole time, the, the joke was that the savings and loans were the 363 industry. You pay 3% on savings, you get 6% on mortgages, and you're on the golf course at 3 p.m. So the idea that the savings and loans weren't making money, which was part of the argument, for the deregulation that you're, you're limiting them. I very rarely saw a savings and loan bank president out on the street with a little tin can collecting money. Yeah, I mean, I remember when I was younger, I had an account at a savings loan in Texas, and I went in one day to withdraw some money, and I got a lecture from the uh, clerk on how, at a savings and loan, this is not demand deposit. Mm -hmm. and that you actually are supposed to apply in advance to get your money back. Now, they gave me the money. It wasn't much, but, you know, the, it they operated in a completely different way. Well, today, if you'd go, they'd say they don't have the money. Yeah. But yeah. They'll, they'll let you bet on a derivative. Well, yeah, you know, you go into the bank today, you get robbed by the bank. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, but, you know, I think the, the important thing about this is that, that you and I were there in Texas in the 80s, and we chronicled for the Executive Intelligence Review week by week the bank collapses, the, the looting that was being done. And the, the picture, actually, this is something that, if you look at it, what we see today with the elimination of Glass-Steagall, you and I were looking at the beginnings of that process with the 1980 deregulation bill and then 1982, the Garn St. Germain bill, which eliminated the distinction between SNLs and, and the commercial banks. And you remember we put out this report, the Citibank report, and, and I'd like your thoughts on the role of Citibank, since Citibank played a big role uh, in this whole process of eliminating Glass-Steagall and building up securitization. Your thoughts on what Citibank was doing back in the early 80s? Well, at this point, Citibank was the largest bank in the United States. And it was, it had a very predatory history. Uh, as a sort of, that's fairly obvious, I guess, for a big bank, because mm -hmm. that's how they get big. But, uh, you know, Walter Riston, who was the head of Citibank, who was one of the premier bankers of the day. Yeah. And, and a key promoter of the idea of the post-industrial economy. Yeah. yeah. Why, why waste money building industry when you can, if you could free it from any yeah. kind of investment, you could then mm -hmm. have it to make money for money. Yeah. And so you had this whole transformation of the U.S. financial system going on. And so Citi was in the forefront of this. They weren't the, necessarily the leaders, but they were one of the driving forces behind this. And so, you know, Walter Riston had, he had made several famous comments, one of which is that uh, sovereign nations don't go bankrupt, uh, which turned out not quite to be the case. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, you know, you want to go after the SNLs because that's where the money is. Which is, was the intent 
of the 1982 bill, yes. which yes. did away with uh, virtually every protection of the savings and loan, yeah. and then said to the savings and loan boards, you're on your own, you've got to start competing with the commercial banks if you want money to come in to make loans for mortgages. It also opened a little bit of the door for the commercial banks to get into the real estate business. Yeah. I mean, the SNL business was highly regulated, and it had to be because what, you, what was required for that model to work is stable interest rates over long periods of time. If you're going to make 30-year loans at fixed interest rates, you have to know that the interest rates are not going to rise That's right. during that 30 years because if you make a loan at 5% and then interest rates go up to 7%, you're having to pay money for your deposits. The whole thing requires stability. And, and also, that way, you guarantee an income stream with the monthly payments on the mortgage so that you have more money that you can continue to create loans so you don't have to create a pyramid or a Ponzi scheme. Yeah. yeah. And what was being targeted by this financial, what they called financial modernization, is precisely that kind of stability. Yeah. That you wanted to be able to whipsaw the markets that you wanted to make money off of movements. Fluctuations are good because as long as things are moving, you can yeah. buy them, you can sell them, you can make money off of it. So the SNLs had to be destroyed. And what happened is that they were deliberately taken down by these changes in the regulations, which destroyed the stability of the industry. And one of the things I think is important is this idea that, well, it was the corruption of the SNL owners that led to their demise. In fact, it was the SNL owners having to compete with the corruption of the commercial bankers, which caused them to start making loans which were inadvisable. In, a, in the same way that you know, the people who say today, well, it's the, the uh, borrowers, the, the people who took out mortgages who lied, and that's what created the real estate bubble. No, it's the other way around. It all came from the top. You had the, bank, you had the, the bankers who moved into the SNLs. So you start financing certain... Some of the hot money guys moved into SNLs and took them over. And then they started playing the junk bond markets and speculating. And then they that, started. That, that was key, John, because yeah. you had Columbia SNL, you had the operation tied to Michael Milken, mm -hmm. who said, why let this money sit around like a piggy bank? Mm -hmm. Which is exactly what you were describing the person, the teller, telling you. Yeah. Keep the money here so you build something up. Mm -hmm. Milken's line was, no, let's put it to work. Let's tee up General Motors. Let's take over Revlon, take over RJR Nabisco, mm -hmm. and create a speculative pool. And the savings and loans were more liquid because of the protection than the commercial banks. Yeah. And so you had the hot money guys come in, and then they started offering, to attract money, they started offering higher deposit rates. So if you bring, put your money here, we'll give you more money than your local SNL. So the SNLs couldn't compete with that. And the more money shifted towards the hot money guys, then the traditional SNLs that wanted to maintain the business had a very dilemma, a real dilemma, because either they were losing money yeah. the way they were going. They couldn't stay in business. Well, remember, the other thing that happened at the beginning of the 80s was, and it has to be said, Paul Volcker jacked interest rates right up through the roof, and Lyndon LaRouche launched a campaign against Volcker's high interest rates. Because, as you said, if you're paying out or getting in 6%, and interest rates are at 20%, how can you stay in business? Yeah, so the SNLs were destroyed by design, by changes in the laws, which opened up the way for the parasites to move in, and then the parasites moved in, well-funded, through things like the milk and junk bond machine, which, as we have uh, indicated in the past, is tied directly into things like the Morgan and the Rothschild interest. Well, I, now I, I want to get to this point because, you know, some people look at this thing and they say, well, this was the American banking system. But as we know, in the United States, the deregulation push started under the Carter administration, which was controlled not by any American interest. But then you had, in 1979, Margaret Thatcher come to power, and over a period of, of six years, shifts in the British banking system, which then culminated in what was called the Big Bang, where London moved to become the global financial center. Now, how did that affect the United States? Well, there was a parallel process going on in Europe and in the United States that uh, you can date it back to... I mean, it goes back to the death of FDR, right? the assault on the United States, the decision by the British Empire that the United States had to be taken down. 
And the way it was going to be done was through these kinds of financial measures. Deindustrialization right. to destroy our real economy and then turning us into financial parasites and building a bubble which will ultimately explode. And the British side of this, the British financial interests, which were completely deregulated in terms of the offshore side of it, was to pull the money out of the United States into the international markets as a kind of uh, asset base for new, new unheard of levels of leverage that just increased the indebtedness of the United States. Yeah, I mean, it's what we know today as globalization. Was a new form of colonialism. A new form of colonialism. That yeah. Globalization with the giant cartels, you know, the bankers run the cartels, the cartels run the world. Uh, this is basically a return to the model of the British East India Company. Right. So it's what's presented as modernization is actually going back to something much older. The real modernization was what FDR did. That's right. So you had this. And, and John, this is important because the argument for doing all this is that we're moving to the new economy because of the speed of computers and national boundaries get in the way. Regulated systems get in the way, and the business model is faster and bigger, and no restrictions. And look where that's gotten us. Well, you know what? Two thirds, three quarters of the trading on the New York Stock Exchange is now done by dueling computers, who are playing, making trades in milliseconds. You know, there's no economic activity going on. There's just speculation. And who knew that the computers like to play Texas Hold'em with your future money? <laughs> Yeah, and given the, given what has happened to Texas, you know, Texas Hold'em is not a very smart game. And, of course, Barney Frank wants to establish national computer gambling operations. Yeah, well, maybe, you know, maybe he's uh, Barney Holding or something like that. Well, ba holding. bailout Barney is part of this. Now, mm -hmm. uh, you were go let's, let's go back to this question, though, of the, the Morgan Rothschild interests and then the role of, of key operatives for them, like... Alan Greenspan and, and mm -hmm. Landfill Graham, the, the former lamented senator from Texas. Yeah, take a couple of key dates, 1968, which is the launching in the United States of both the rock drug sex counterculture and the uh, Bilderberger annual meeting in Montreblanc, Canada, which where this World Company project was announced, which is a, this is the policy the announcement of the policy to build these cartels mm -hmm. explicitly as an attack on the nation state to replace the nation states as the ruling body of the world with these corporate cartels as a way of managing raw materials and things like that, managing the world in a Malthusian era. So this was the explicit policy and it was announced in 68. It was older than that, but this was sort of the new marketing scheme. All right. Then you have in 1971, you have Nixon takes the dollar off of gold. Mm -hmm. All right. At the same the same year, the Inner Alpha Group yeah. is founded. Yeah. All right. The Inner Alpha Group is designed to take advantage of the speculation on currencies that the end of the Bretton Woods system allows. Because the first thing, the first implication of the Nixon ending Bretton Woods was that currencies were turned into just another commodity. Yeah. There was no longer fixed exchange, so there was no protection of any country from what we've seen in recent years, speculative predators like George Soros uh, and like the hedge funds that, that come into countries with more money than the countries themselves have. Mm -hmm. So they can devalue currencies and, and kill off people overnight. Yeah. Well, you had, you know, the Bretton Woods were broken in 71. Then you had in 73, 74, mm -hmm. the Middle East crisis, the first oil hoax, yeah. which then where the spot market was created. And the spot market created a pool of dollars in Europe that could then be used to run financial warfare against the United States. And so the more dollars piled up in Europe, and this got worse after the 1979 world crisis. And, and Lynn refers to this as the Anglo-Dutch-Saudi financial interests. Yeah. So you created a huge slush fund of dollars in Europe that could be then be used as financial warfare against the United States. And so the United States actually lost control of its own dollar through this process. Yeah. And this is what controls the dollar today. The British Empire controls the dollar, not the United States. Now, meanwhile, in the U.S., you had Felix Roten as the head of Lazard, right. as the head of the New York Stock Exchange Crisis Committee, beginning to restructure Wall Street. You had this process whereby the old-style 
merchant bankers were being pushed out and the new style traders were coming in. Traders this is traders with a D. With a D yes, but yes. But most of them, you could mm -hmm. add an I and a T and get rid of the D and you wouldn't know the difference. Yeah. And so this is the, this is the emergence of the securities market, right. which is a major part of this globalization to create markets, securities markets and everything which could be traded as a control mechanism. Now, John, while this was going on, you remember the propaganda because I, I, I don't remember if you were with me, but at the Texas League of Savings meeting in uh, June 1982, there was a panel where Citibank was explaining to Texas bankers how there was going to be a flow of money from New York and internationally into the Texas banks if they get rid of the interstate restrictions and, and lift the restrictions between mortgage banks and, and commercial banks. And we were there with a Citibank report showing that, in fact, they're going to be snookered if they go along with this. And these oh-so-clever Texans who thought they, they were really on the inside uh, and didn't realize or didn't want to realize, they thought they were going to get rich. So they didn't want to realize that this was this international takedown of the protection that had been established in 1933 against precisely the same kind of operations in the 1920s. Yeah. The great irony is that this was all sold as if you open up, if you deregulate, the money will flow in. Yeah. And in fact, what happens, the whole purpose of deregulation was to suck the money out into these international financial markets to build them up and to make them primary in the world. And the ideological catchphrase is competition, free markets. If we get the government out, or as Phil, Gov uh, Phil Graham would say, get the government off our backs. You get the government out, and then businessmen can trade based on the, the secrets of the marketplace. And everything self-regulating and will be well. And of course, these poor guys, half of the Texas SNL directors ended up in prison, railroaded. Mm -hmm. And the liquidity in the savings and loans ended up in the hands of people like Ronald Perlman, one of Milken's monsters, mm -hmm. uh, Meshuggah or Rickless, <laughs> people of this sort, the, the junk bond bandits, who all of a sudden were getting paid by the government and getting tax credits for taking over the liquidity in the SNLs, and the U.S. government took the debts. Yeah, and the, the, the big banks started cherry-picking the SNL assets they wanted, so the, the big banks were absorbing the SNLs into the banking system, which is precisely what Walter Riston had identified. And not only did the SNL system collapse in Texas and largely across the nation, but the, almost all of the Texas banking system collapsed. It was... Uh, it was just enormous bloodletting. You, you remember the charts? We, we, you, you prepared charts for me every week, how many SNLs were going under and how many were still left. And this was paralleled by the collapse of the rig count because they were destroying the oil, the U.S. domestic oil production at the same time by mm -hmm. driving the price through the floor. So in, in Texas in 84, 85, there were, in the city of Houston, 55,000 foreclosures, I believe, in 1984. And yeah. this then paved the way for the, the new financing after 87 with Greenspan's wall of money and then the all-out assault going again from 84 on with Greenspan working with J.P. Morgan, I believe, and talking about getting rid of Glass-Steagall so we can open everything up. Yeah, yeah. And so the more you open things up, the more you internationalized everything, the worse it all got because it was an extractive mechanism. And the physical economy, the productivity of the United States collapsed. Well, it, it not only collapsed, it was in, in terms of infrastructure. There was no investment, as, as Lyndon LaRouche keeps pointing out, from the, the mid-60s onward. There was a net disinvestment in terms of infrastructure. Uh, the, in terms of physical industry, we were told this is the old economy. Let's send it off to some poor, underprivileged nation that would be glad to get our dirty industries, and we could move to the clean technologies of computers, information technology. And this is what the baby boomer generation fell for, hook, line, and sinker. It wasn't just dumb Texas bankers. It was our whole generation which yeah. said, you mean we don't have to work to make money? How great is that? Mm -hmm. All our time can go for rock, sex, and drugs. Yeah. It's the best economy available. Yeah. So by the end of the 1980s, the U.S. economy was bankrupt. And we had begun this shift into derivatives. 
as, as the virtualization of the economy. And let's add the key role again of one of the Graham family members, Wendy Graham, who probably also has a Graham-sized brain. Yeah. At the CFTC, deregulating the futures markets to create massive over-the-counter derivatives. Yeah. Trade. And what Wendy Graham did at the CFTC was largely paved the way for the creation of Enron, right? Which then uh, gave her a board position. She was on the board of Enron when it collapsed. You know, but Enron is a good example of how this works because. Mm -hmm. Enron had been a kind of a sleepy uh, pipeline company. And so it was taken... The, it was called Entex or something like that? It was uh, Houston Natural Gas merged with Internorth. That's right. All right. And so... And I think Lazard was the, the, involved that, in yeah, the merger. Yeah, their long-term investment banker was, yeah. was the Lizards. Yeah. You know, so it's a very small world. Yes. You know, where you look at all of these things and you keep finding firms like Lazard, right in the heart of it. Because this is, this is a European investment bank which is involved in steering things inside the United States. It's a, uh, it's treason. And Rowetton is still around. Felix yeah. Rowetton, who was at Lazard Frere, who was a partner with George Schultz and the, the uh, fascist dictatorship in Chile, mm -hmm. who continues to ally himself with Schultz, even though Schultz is supposedly a conservative Republican and Rowetton a liberal Democrat. And then Rowetton was the one who financed the creation, along with a few organized crime figures, of the uh, DLC, the Democratic Leadership Council, to say we've got to get rid of Franklin Roosevelt and the Democratic Party. Yeah. No Roosevelt tradition. Yeah, that's uh, not a surprising position for a European synarchist fascist. <laughs> <laughs> I guess you could say that. <laughs> but you take Enron. Okay, so when Thatcher was doing the uh, uh, deregulation and privatization yeah. in Britain, Enron was brought in to learn the ropes of electricity deregulation in Britain under Thatcher. Mm -hmm. And the, the person who brought Enron in the energy czar in the Thatcher government was a man named Lord, uh, John Wakeham. And so you had the Thatcher government running the government side of selling off the electricity interest of this, the government. And the private side of this was being managed by N.M. Rothschild. Mm -hmm. So this is where Enron learned electricity deregulation. This was made in Britain. Mm -hmm. And then Enron brought that knowledge back to the United States. So-called knowledge. So-called knowledge. Yes, the they learned how to steal. Yeah, well, that you know, that's the the old uh, Dickens uh, pickpocket process. Yeah, yeah. And so then, very interesting thing happened after Thatcher left office. John Wakeham was promoted to Lord John Wakeham. You know, the British love mm -hmm. their lords, mm -hmm. and uh, he became both. He joined in M. Rothschild, and he became a director of Enron. Mm. So you had a man from N.M. Rothschild on the board of Enron at the point at which it collapsed. You know, this is very definite. So you have the Lazard Rothschild at Enron. That's what Enron really was. And then, John, I think the, the final piece in this picture is when Blair came in, the New Labor, and they had Big Bang too, which preceded the final repeal of Glass-Steagall in 1999. The Graham Leach Bliley Act, Phil Graham's last lasting contribution to put him in the hall of infamy, was well, his role in, in getting rid of Glass Steagall. Well, he did to give him credit. He did have a career after that. He went on to be a consultant for UBS, which uh, lost more than just about any bank in the world in uh, derivative speculation. Well, who knows BS better than Phil Graham? That's right. He's an expert. So. You know, this is a, it's actually a very small world when you look at how this stuff is steered. And this it really is the U.S. side of this inner alpha group process. And so what we saw from the ground floor in Texas in the early 80s was really a pilot project, which included the securitization and the real estate bubble. Mm -hmm. It included the derivative operations, and it included the battering ram to destroy Glass-Steagall and the FDR tradition, and it included right-wing anti-government Republicans like Phil Graham and so-called liberal social Democrats like Felix Rowett. And so this is what we're facing today in the fight to restore Glass-Steagall. The, the errors of this process, the degenerate bailout king Barney Frank from, from Massachusetts 
Uh, Harry Reid, you know, Lynn used to say that uh, Phil Graham taught the snakes to be sidewinders in Texas. Well, Harry Reid did the same thing in, in Nevada. And then on top of that, the hand-picked president of these speculators and financiers, Barack Hussein Obama, whose role is to finish off the job that Bush and Cheney couldn't do, which is to find the final destruction of the United States as a sovereign republic. Yeah, I mean, in, in part you have during the Bush, up through the Bush era, you still had the illusion that the bubble was growing, that the, the economy was expanding. We were making money because the derivatives markets were growing, all of this. And so we had this, this real... And it, it would all, trickle down through Wall Street if you had a good investor. Yes. If the people in the big house had more than they could eat, then everybody else on the plantation, including the slaves, would have some crumbs left over. You know, that was our policy. That was... But this whole thing blew up yeah. in 2007. And so now you have Obama coming in who's got a different role. His role is to manage the takedown right. of the United States uh, under this, in this Malthusian worldview. So now we have the, the greenie policy being pushed. So Well, we see the British petroleum in the Gulf hand in hand with Obama using a catastrophic oil spill instead of stopping it. They're using it as an excuse to put up more solar panels and, and wind mills in the United States. Yeah, we're gonna have to learn to live with less. This is the beginnings of the, the imposition of austerity, crushing austerity on the American population and on the people of the Hitler world. Hitler-style austerity, which is why we have the mustache on Barack Obama, because he grew it. He grew it, yeah. yeah. I mean, this is his policy. He can shave it off every day, but it keeps growing back. <laughs> and it's the only thing that's growing in the United States right now. Yeah. I mean, you see this in the health care bill, which is explicitly modeled on Hitler's health care plan. You see this in the push for sustainable energy and things mm -hmm. like that, which means that there's no chance that we can actually build our way out of this mess. Yeah. And, you know, right now we're facing a demographic horror because you have a level of population which can no longer be supported by the existing level of the economy. But I think we should, we should conclude this discussion with a, a final simple point for the viewers, which is that there's nothing inevitable about this. Obama can be impeached as he's, his popularity is collapsing. He's about as popular as cactus fever in most parts of the country. There's also a growing support in the population. When they know what Glass-Steagall is, there's growing support for it. And we have our three campaigns with uh, Keisha Rogers in Texas, Summer Shields in California, and Rachel Brown in, in Massachusetts, gaining in support around the fight for Glass-Steagall. So despite what seems to be an inevitable process, the only thing that was inevitable is that sooner or later, the sleeping giant of the American people would wake up. Now the only question is, will they get the right policy when they wake up, or will they go off in different directions and, and uh, create a chaotic French Revolution style situation which will play into the hands of our nation's enemies. Yeah, you know, I think of this the Malaysian monkey trap. Now, you know, you have the way they catch monkeys in Malaysia is they have a jar with a narrow neck. They put a nut inside of it. The nut will fit in the neck. The monkey sticks his paw in, grabs hold of the nut, and then he can't pull his arm out. And all the monkey has to do to escape is to let go of the nut and pull his hand out. So you're saying we have to let go of the nuts that are running this country? Yeah, we have to <laughs> let go of our illusions that we have all this money, that we have to admit that this is fictitious capital, we have to admit that our country is headed down the path for destruction, that we don't need to do this. We can actually change the policy. We have the policies. We know what to do. We just have to actually decide to do it. Let this stuff go, change the way we out, change our outlook, and there's no reason why we can't move on to a new renaissance. And there's no reason the thieves and the swindlers should get bailout money. They should be looking at prison time, get back the, the money and turn it into credit with the National Bank and rebuild our country. And in that case, we could take this whole 71 period to 2010, look at this as the final example of what happens when you allow imperial policies to undermine a republic. And so in that sense, the, from whether you talk about the Malaysian nut uh, analogy or Benjamin Franklin saying it's a republic if we can keep it, it's up to us. Yeah. So let's keep it. I, I agree, John. All right. Well, that concludes today's show. Thank you.